Good afternoon and good morning to uh, our West Coast folks. And thank you for so much for joining us today for the launch of the American Bar Association Civil Rights and Social Justice Section's career webinar series, The Civil Rights Lawyer, Perspectives on the Profession. I'm Janelle George, and along with Michelle McLeod of the Civil Rights and Social Justice Section, we welcome you to this program, which is the first of four panels in this career series. I do wanna note that the views expressed herein have not been approved by the House of Delegates or the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association and accordingly should not be construed as representing the policy of the American Bar Association. They are the views of the individuals themselves in their personal capacities. I do want to note that at the end, we will take questions uh, and you will find at the very bottom of the panel here, the Q&A uh, button. It has two little like comment bubbles, it looks like there. Instead of using the chat, if you could submit your questions via the Q&A uh, button, we will try our very best to address as many uh, of those questions as we can. Please note that we'll also be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And we welcome any feedback or questions that you might have as follow-up. Now, it's our pleasure to welcome our phenomenal panelists who will share lessons learned from their civil rights careers. But first, it's my pleasure to also introduce a uh, great civil rights lawyer in our section chair, Angela Scott. Uh, Ms. Scott is a civil rights attorney and advisor for the Office of the General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where she works to address discrimination, expand access to health care, and help in health care disparities. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you, Janelle. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, before I begin, as a government attorney, I have to provide my usual disclaimer. Um, and that is I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of my employer. Nothing that will be discussed during this webinar represents the views of any component of the United States federal government. Um, so with that being said, as a civil rights attorney who has been involved in the great work of our section for well over a decade now, I recognize that we focus a lot on the substantive issues, which is important but we don't necessarily focus on the attorneys who practice in this area. Um, and so I wanted to create a space for our section to be able to focus on those attorneys who actually practice in the field so that we could be supportive of them, much like other substantive ABA sections are supportive of the practitioners in their area. Um, I also wanted to provide information and insight to those who want to get into this field um, we know we need civil rights attorneys now more than ever. So I think our section is the appropriate space to provide that insight um, into this noble profession. Uh, I wanna thank both Janelle George and Michelle McLeod for organizing this very important four-part series um, and our staff and our panelists for the work that they've put into this. There are, last I checked, over 300 people currently logged in uh, to view the program. So most importantly, I wanna thank you for joining us today. I hope this is useful to you. Um, and with that, I wanna turn it back over to Janelle. Thanks so much, Angela. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to what is really an esteemed panel of civil rights practitioners, scholars, and advocates. Uh, you can read more details about their bios in the handout uh, that is on the registration page, but I would like to provide uh, some very brief intros. Uh, we have uh, Letitia Smith Evans Haynes who uh, has done some great work as a strategist, facilitator, and problem solver on um, matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it, she has been at the fore of conversation and action. She currently serves as the vice president for institutional diversity, equity, and inclusion at Williams College, where she leads the institution's departments and committees to develop and implement non-discrimination policies, uh, facilitate critical conversations on equity inclusion, and assess campus climate, address conflicts, and mentor students and faculty uh, uh, members. Thank you to Letitia for joining us. 
We also have uh, Professor Marcy Karen. She is the Jack Lovell Allender, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Professor of Law and Director of the Legislation Clinic, uh, the Legislation and Civil Rights Clinic at the University of the District of Columbia's David A. Clark School of Law. She teaches and writes in the areas of legislative lawyering, employment law, gender, sexual orientation in the law, civil rights, uh, civil justice for the military community, and clinical pedagogy. Her most recent scholarship focuses on workplace protections for the military community, survivors of domestic violence, breastfeeding workers, uh, menstruators, and people with disabilities. So welcome to Professor Karen. Uh, Patrice Sult Sultan uh, is an attorney. She's a professor. Uh, she is a lifelong organizer and criminal justice reform advocate in DC, and her career is devoted to fundamentally changing the way people think about who we punish, why we punish, and how we punish. She currently serves as director for the DC Justice Lab, uh, and she also has served as senior attorney advisor to the Criminal Code uh, Reform Commission, which is responsible for drafting a comprehensive set of revisions to the criminal laws in the District of Columbia. Welcome, uh, Patrice Sultan. And we have Andrew Harrison, who is a civil rights attorney and writer. He's based in Austin, Texas. He currently serves as the Education Justice Project Director of Te Texas Appleseed, which is a public interest justice center uh, based in Austin. And he is also the secretary of the board of Learn Together, Live Together, which is a school integration nonprofit uh, based in Washington, DC. He has also previously served as an attorney at the Advancement Project, which is a multiracial civil rights organization also in DC, uh, where he also worked on helping to end the uh, school to prison pipeline. So welcome to all of our uh, wonderful panelists. Uh, I do want to also underscore that a recording of this program will be uh, made available afterwards. So for those who are unable to join. Uh, I think the first question uh, is really, uh, since this first uh, of our series is about entry into the profession. What inspired you to engage in civil rights work, particularly when we think of the challenging times that we're experiencing right now, where it's so difficult, frankly, to do some of this work, uh, where the climate can be very uh, divisive? Uh, what inspired you? Uh, I'll, I will start with Andrew. Uh, our, I think our newest attorney, <laughs> relatively, of the group. Yeah, thank you so much, Janelle, and to Michelle and Angela and Ali and the Civil Rights and Social Justice section for hosting this very timely chat. So for me, a part of my childhood was spent in St. Louis, Missouri, probably from the time I was in the second grade through the seventh grade. And my family and I lived in Florissant, which is an adjacent suburb to Ferguson. And so when I was in law school, going into my second year of law school, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. And it really just you know, shocked me to my core, like so many Black Americans and other folks witnessing it. You know, when I enrolled in law school, I probably thought that I wanted to be a public defender in Louisiana. I went to law school at Louisiana State University. But then after Michael Brown, I started thinking of more impact litigation I could do or work to address systemic racism at a broader level. And so, you know, I had gone to undergrad in DC at Howard and had attended a church in Northeast DC uh, where one of the senior attorneys at Advancement Project worship and connected with him on Facebook to say, hey, are y'all offering any internships for the summer of 2015? And, He's like, yeah, let me connect you to the internship coordinator. And that just started this path you know, over the past five years where my internship, it's translated into a postgraduate fellowship at the Lawyers Committee, the staff attorney job at Advancement Project, and now this work at Texas Appleseed. And yeah, yeah. it's something that, that murder of Michael Brown that really catalyzed this work, I think, for me. 
Thank you, Andrew. That's that's powerful. Uh, Leticia, what what has brought you to this work? Thanks. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, and I'll, I'd say that uh, I think most of what I experienced or saw or witnessed as a, a child growing up um, from New York City, um, Brooklyn to be precise, um, really had an impact on me. I mean, I, I grew up in a family of civil rights advocates, so I had that perspective and kind of being out and uh, fighting for people's rights. But at the same time, there were things that I um, experienced or was exposed to, um, some things that, that you know, I think received national attention um, were, you know, the, the brutalization of Abner Louima, um, the beating of Rodney King. These are things that all happened during my childhood. And I started to see a pattern uh, developing where people who um, had different identities or certain identities were uh, treated in certain ways that were uh, not equitable. And those things really helped me understand the preventative or proactive advocacy that I was seeing um, that, that friends and family members were engaged in. And those were just, they, they really stuck in my mind as um, things that I, I, was, I could not believe was happening. Um, and that was really juxtaposed with my experience at school and, and um, the schools that I went to and people expressing different views and opinions about um, people's rights and, and their actions. So those are, some, those are the things that really pushed me to understand more, to research, to learn, to want to engage um, more. And I had every, every internship or fellowship that I had, um, certainly when I was in law school, was in the public interest arena and, and my work after that as well. Um, some of my work after that as well. So. Thank you. Marcy, what, what has brought you to this work? Yeah, um, well, thank you for inviting me um, to participate in the conversation. And I think you're hearing a theme because what brought me to this work is, you know, being human and having lived experiences and loved ones with lived experiences, whether it was experiencing homelessness or being on food stamps and having them taken away or surviving sexual assault or having multiple disabilities and seeing the way in which the world interacted. Um, uh, and what inspires me to stay engaged in this work, I don't think will surprise anyone that's watching or anyone that's on this panel, which is the same lived experiences and having some pretty amazing students and clients with lived experiences that um, need to understand this complicated patchwork of laws that are um, continuing to put barriers in the place of not just surviving, but thriving. So that's what keeps me here. Thank you so much. And, and Patrice, what, what has brought you to this work? Thanks for including me. I um, was really immersed in civil rights work from an early age and had a strong interest um, in racial justice and civil rights before I had an interest in the law. Um, my mom, who's actually watching right now and is an ABA member, <laughs> uh, was always kind of taking me with her to meetings and marches and everything in between the courtroom even, which probably was not um, something that judges appreciated <laughs> very much uh, when I was really young. And once I got to law school and got to start trying things out in the criminal justice space, to be honest, part of why I cared about it so much was that I thought it was the most important racial justice issue of our time. But part of it is I really like doing criminal work. I think criminal litigation is fun. And I think that civil rights lawyers should enjoy the work that they're doing. I think you can find a space that you really like. And interviewing clients, counseling people, investigating cases, arguing with juries about who done it is really exciting and exhilarating work in my view. Um, there are times that are really challenging and stressful of course as well, but that's part of the reason that I found myself in this space. Um, and I'm excited that there's so much energy around criminal justice reform now. And it's really cool to see um, as my career uh, continues to grow that like the nation is really continuing to grow into this moment as well. Great, thank you all so much. This is um, just so powerful. And we're already receiving comments uh, and, and questions. Uh, I, I want to flag one comment from uh, Jennifer Mohawk who says, 
general comment from an old lady, her words, not mine. Uh, thank you all for the work that you're doing. Uh, it's really easy to be for things like civil rights when there's not much opposition, not so much when the other right side represents a serious threat. Uh, this is when you find out who is and who isn't. You are all the hope of our collective future. You all rock. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that comment. Um, I, I also think it's important too, uh, to obviously recognize not only the challenges in, of, to civil rights during this time, but that have always existed, right? And the, the challenges of being in this profession uh, so what is one thing, this is my next question, I'll give you you all a couple, couple minutes to think about this because I think I'm going to answer this as well, but what is something you wish you had known uh, about before you entered this work and that you have since learned along the way? I think for, for I will take some liberty here and say, uh, Letitia mentioned some of the internships that uh, she did and uh, one thing I think I learned, uh, at least at that time, and a lot of the landscape is changing, but when, when I entered this arena, a lot of the internships were unpaid. Uh, so I had to find ways to fund, you know, my summer internships or that work. Uh, one year I came out to DC, I interned with the Children's Defense Fund and that really uh, deepened my desire to, to want to be in DC, to have a proximity to working on policy, uh, but just really understanding, frankly, I, I, I think we can all be honest here, some of the financial challenges that exist to doing this work. Um, frankly, the competitiveness uh, in this arena uh, so those were things that I had to figure out ways to strategize about uh, and, and to be able to support myself, take care of myself while still doing this work. Uh, I will start actually with, with Letitia for this. What is something that you wish you had known that you've since learned about uh, in entering this, this uh, area of work? Um, thanks for starting with me. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, um, I think, I think it can be exhausting. Um, and it's difficult to appreciate, um, how much so in, in, until you're really in it and it's, it can be emotional. Um, there are, you know, when I think about the work itself, some of the work that I valued the most was really engaging, um, with clients or people who, um, the work that I was doing was affecting or supporting um, and working hand in hand and in partnership with them. My work was very much, um, you know, it was partially in the courts, but a lot of times it was in communities. And uh, that was so, so essential. So it was, I was very, very tied to those communities in many ways. Um, and that's something that, that uh, you know, it's very, it's, it, it's deep. It's very deep. It's very deep work. And it's not something that I was able to easily divorce myself from um, when I went home, whenever that was, because you know, sometimes this this work was long. This was not, you know, I, I none of my jobs doing this work, um, civil rights work, racial justice work was nine to five jobs, none of them. And so um, that is something that was difficult to do. You, you're constantly thinking about how to make things better, constantly thinking about what's a new strategy, like who are the partners, who can we bring along. Um, so that's something that I didn't, ex that I didn't expect. Um, yeah, put that. Thank you. I have other things if, if you need more things on the list. <laughs> Andrew, what, what is something that you wish you had known? <laughs> I don't work for the government, so I have more liberty on this question. <laughs> I think I didn't recognize the bipartisan commitment to the punishment bureaucracy that exists, especially for young people. So a lot of my efforts are devoted to dismantling the school to prison pipeline. And one thing that we focused on significantly, even during the Obama administration, was the Department of Justice's COPS program that provides funding to local law enforcement agencies that either contract with local school districts or are embedded within school districts across the country. And you know that has been something over the past five years, especially as I have engaged in my political education and grown in this work, just kind of recognizing that, you know, talking about these issues and uplifting the efforts of directly impacted people, whether they're young people or parents, 
in the fight to dismantle the school to prison pipeline transcends Democratic and Republican administration. So it really is just a long haul game. Right, right. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And I just say too, I want to make sure it was it's exhausting, but it's extremely rewarding. So I would not change anything. I just wanted to put that in. <laughs> give you a negative it's not negative what I'm saying. It's just no absolutely. Absolutely. Right. That's the reality. That's the reality. Patrice, what is something you wish you had known? Um, shortly after being in the courtroom for a little while, I noticed how unfair a lot of the laws were. And it didn't take me long to kind of march over to the city council and say, hey, you know, I live in ward such and such, and I've been practicing criminal law. And this law that you wrote is not working the way you intended. You should see the way prosecutors are using it. You should see the way the judges are interpreting it. And you should see the way it's affecting people who live in the city. And I was shocked to see my name and my thoughts incorporated into their reasoning behind changing a law. And I wish I knew earlier that it was that easy <laughs> to make my voice heard um, and to bring my experience um, to the council's attention and to be able to actually change the laws that we're living under, most of which are not very good. Um, they're not well drafted, they're not carefully drafted. Usually it's in response to a flashpoint in the news and or a political agenda that happens to be um, you know, really salient at that moment in history. And I think we should all be um, playing a really active role there. And I wish I'd thought about it even sooner than I did. Thank you. Marcy, what, what is something you wish you had known? Yeah, I wish I knew that I was a civil rights lawyer, right? That you don't have to have a full-time job that has that in your title to realize that you were doing civil rights work. And so it took me a while to realize that was a part of my core identity. And also people don't always think of workers' rights as civil rights, but they are, or women's rights as civil rights, but they are, or trans rights as civil rights, but they are. And so that, that this was a core part of my identity already. And it just took me a little bit to, to recognize and claim that space myself. Um, and since I'm a professor, I'm gonna fight the hypo and give a second one too, but that's okay, Janelle. Um, I'll say I also, um, you know, working with students um, over the last 15 plus years, uh, I see so many of them feeling alone, right? That they're the only ones that are in a room that look like themselves or that have the, the experience when they're in a room of power. And I just would say that um, I wish they knew that they don't have to be alone, right? That there might not be someone else in the room with them, but there's someone else out there that is an ally or is a community for them. It just might take someone making that connection for them or using social media or whatever it is for them to recognize that there is a community of support behind you and you don't have to be the only one that's in the room, even if you're the only one physically there. Thank you, thank you. And I, that's a perfect segue into the next question about your current work. Uh, and I'm actually going to uh, pull from an audience question. Um, Danny, Benson Vega has asked, there are so many different issues within the civil rights arena. How, how do you decide where to focus your energy? Uh, so can you each talk a little bit about your current work and how you focus uh, your, your energy uh, in, that, in that particular work? I'm actually going to go in a different order. Um, Marcy, since you just shared and, and actually started uh, to address that, why teaching? Uh, why that arena? Yeah, um, I love teaching and I love helping my students recognize that you can appreciate and enjoy being a lawyer, even if it is exhausting at times. That the power and privilege that comes with the degree is so critical to changing our communities. And the way in which I teach is by, or one of the ways in which I teach is by um, supervising students working for nonprofit or community groups that are working on systemic reform issues on the local and national level to really sort of lift people out of poverty to recognize and advance civil rights. And in choosing the projects that we work on and the clients that we work with, I really look for those that um, don't have access to other legislative lawyers that need perhaps some um, ability to help frame a message, to understand that it is as easy as Patrice mentioned. You can go right here in DC to the Wilson building when going places in real life is a thing again, um, or you can log on or you can, you can really make a huge difference. And so I look for groups that allow my students to, to 
understand the power they have by providing a sort of access to justice gap for groups that need legislative lawyering services and expanding the role of civil rights um, to those communities that just might need some, some help in that way. Thank you. And to Patrice, and, and I will pull from another audience question as well to, to add, uh, compound this question about your current work, but uh, what is your advice for someone who's in the process of applying to law school, um, but is, knows they're really interested in working in the policy space uh, about entering that, that particular space? Yeah, so I remember when I started in law school, I'd given some thought to doing a dual degree program, like a law, like a JD and a master's in public policy. And some of the advice that I got was that it wouldn't help me professionally in terms of getting a job at graduation, but if it was something that I just wanted to learn just for the sake of learning it, then this is the time to do it instead of after you're done with school. And part of what dissuaded me from doing it was not wanting to take on the expense of an additional year of school. And I just sort of tried to learn what I could through self-study and after graduation. Um, so I think some of those pressures are still on students now, right? Thinking about how can I learn what I need to learn about legislation and policy um, without having to get a whole separate um, degree and having to pay for it. And I think DC is a great place to be able to get involved on the ground and learn what you can from people working on the Hill and people working um, at the council. But you have to figure out whether you want to study that um, in a formal sense and get a degree in it that way, or if it's something that you can um, learn through your own experiences with other people who are already doing policy work. But if you know already that that's what you eventually wanna do, I think you have to stay engaged in those experiences um, if your law school is not offering a lot of courses in it, or you're not proximate to a place like DC where there are so many people working in this space, I think it's really for you to go out and seek those opportunities um, while you're in school, whether it's in an academic setting or um, through a work experience. Um, and I don't know if that was a very satisfying answer for the person who asked the question, but those are the, at least the things I would consider um, if I were doing it again. No, that's, that's great. Uh, Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, current work as well? Yeah, so in this revolutionary moment of 2020 with the coronavirus pandemic exacerbating those fissures that have been growing in America for 244 years to the mass social movements in protests of the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and others, we have really been calling for the end of school policing. And this is a call that has resonated over the past several years, I think with parents and young people, especially since a number of advocates started documenting these horrendous assaults that were occurring and were being perpetrated by school police officers against young people in schools across the South, the Midwest and other parts of the country and really culminated in this moment of 2020 you know, after Mr. Floyd's murder, seeing the Minneapolis public school system vote to end its contract with the Minneapolis Police Department and the wave of action that continued along that trend in places like Rochester, New York, Columbus, Ohio, and even in Oakland, California, where that unified school district voted to disband its internal school police department entirely. We're trying to bring that political momentum to Texas and to the South more broadly, recognizing that there are various political considerations to it, but also understanding that the tenets of prison industrial complex abolition are really necessary in this moment. Uh, and you know, personally are the only response to this ongoing caste system of the United States, right? That has just adapted across generations, but has continued and persisted. So that's the emphasis of the work right now. It's a lot of policy advocacy, engagement with local communities, but trying to use every avenue available to us to achieve the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And Leticia, your current work. Sure, I would say that, um, I'll try to answer two, two, two things. Um, in terms of my current role, I, I felt that it would be um, extremely helpful for me to do the work through a different lens and to uh, really think about how I was able to um, frame work 
that advances um, issues around social justice, civil rights, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and that's what I've been able to do in my current role. And that's why I, I've stayed in my current role. Um, and being in higher ed at the moment is a, is a certain opportunity because you're touching different constituents. So you're the staff who work here, the faculty who come here or who have been here for decades, and also the students who rotate in and out every you know, four, five years, you know, whatever the time period is. Um, and so that's, that's what um, I decided to do. And I had really um, in my prior role had experience with educational institutions from pre-K through higher education. So I was doing some of that work anyway with thinking about the different operations that school systems or universities had that um, and how they affected these issues that were important. Um, and so I'm just on the inside now trying to move, move the needle um, and partnering with people across higher education to do the same. And so it's the partnerships that are really compelling. And I just wanna, that's tied, related to the piece around um, the policy work. In my other work, um, I was litigating, I was advocate, it was a policy advocate, legislative advocate. So the work was multifaceted. Um, so there are, there are lots of times when you, have, you might have opportunities, even if you're, let's say a litigator, um, to actually advance changes in policies and uh, legislation. And you just have to think about how to, how to take advantage of those opportunities. So sometimes it's just posi it's about positioning yourself with regard to thinking about who the allies are and being a part of those conversations because the work is all very much related, at least from my perspective. And there are several things that um, several times when we, we were able to move forward changes, whether you know, you're talking about the school to prison pipeline, you're talking about desegregation, you're, you're talking about criminal justice, um, and we're able to do that, but not because we took it to the court. So like um, it was because there were partnerships and there were grassroots efforts that we were involved in and a part of learning from and also um, you know, collaborating with others on and really were able to move those things forward in coalition, uh, local and national in many instances. So I just wanted to make sure to, to share that as well. Thank you, thank you. And, and I think it's important also to um, you know, you all talked in the beginning just about what, what compelled you personally to engage in this work. I think it's also important to talk a little bit more about um, per personal care, personal preservation in, in terms of doing this work long term. But before we get to that, I want to ask a little bit about transitions because many of you have, have um, come to and from different fields and what have you learned about uh, transitioning? Um, you know, Leticia, you were a federal uh, clerk, you worked at a private firm. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, transitioning from a private law firm, a uh, big, big law to uh, civil rights? Pay cut, I can tell you that. Um, that was the one major thing. Um, but I would say that you know, I um, when I was at, when I was at the private, the corporate law firm, I was able to take advantage of opportunities to engage in this work as well. So I did that. Um, obviously, you know, at the firm there were billable hours, and um, some of the work that you might do pro, pro bono work would certainly count towards those hours. In fact, it's required at many firms that there are a certain number of hours completed. So I took every opportunity to really. Um, think strategically about those opportunities. Uh, I, I was able to engage in um, looking into some matters of racial profiling in a state, for example, which, and I was the person who was le really leading that work. Um, and so the transition, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say my transition was then to the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And that was the ownership over the work was at a much higher degree. I mean, I, I had ownership over work, don't, don't get me wrong at the firm, but it was a just, it was a very different um, sort of experience, which I very much appreciated, but I was able to actually um, think about issues that I wanted to advance in a different way and was given that ability. And so I was able to help shape, say, we should you know, strategize with my colleagues and say, why don't we think about this? Why don't we think about moving this forward? What can we do? Who are the partners? Whether it's Appleseed or Maldef or Perlda, whoever it is, um, who else is thinking about this? So it was a very different um, sort of opportunity that I was able to take advantage of and to engage in. Um, I'm not sure if that's, that's helpful, 
Absolutely, absolutely. Marcy, you were also at a private firm. Can, can you talk a little bit about that transition as well? Sure. Um, so I loved my experience um, in private practice. Um, part of it was I was lucky enough to do a significant amount of pro bono work. Um, and what I realized when I was thinking about what was next for me, some of the um, work I did supporting survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault was exhausting and triggering for me and figuring out how can I be more engaged in some of the issues that I, I cared about um, in a way that was actually protecting myself and gave me the strength to, to sort of um, grow in other areas. Um, and when I realized that I was financially able to um, take a pretty significant pay cut, <laughs> um, which does prevent some people from doing it. Um, it to be real, uh, I was looking for something that allowed me to, to, to work in areas that I truly cared about, um, which at the time and still involved disability justice, involved workers' rights, and in, um, involved really supporting low-wage workers um, in particular. And so for me, it was about keeping my mind open about what was possible and not possible, that I didn't have to go to a domestic violence organization or a workers' rights organization to be able to do that type of work. Um, I also was open to, to moving because I have a personal situation that allowed me to do that. So if you had told me when I was in law school that I would have spent the better part of a decade in Arizona, I would have actually laughed at you. I had never been there. I didn't know anything about it other than the Grand Canyon was there and there was some dude named Sheriff Joe, right, um, who did bad stuff. But I didn't know a whole lot more at the time. I was just naive. And I'm so grateful that I, I had that flexibility because my just like deep understanding and respect for indigenous people, for issues related to immigration, for just that Southwest culture and community continues to inform my work now that I'm back in DC and just being able to, to, to learn and um, integrate into various communities has really helped different transitions um, happen. But I'll, I'll say um, I still, I'm so grateful for my time in the firm because I still partner with them. I, I put some of my clients in contact with my old firm and they help them pro bono and they have the resources to really devote to issues that some of the nonprofits that I've worked with have to fight for the funds to hire someone to do something. And so the, I'm just grateful that I've had the ability to take these transitions and the connections between going within sectors with um, a different points and places across the country has really helped me and it's really helped my my students you know kind of find their their touch points as well thank you thank you I, i'm gonna throw in a another little question here um <laughs> before we before we close out the the self-care and get to the audience q a um and and also give patrice and andrew an opportunity if they want to respond to the transitions but I also want to ask about, someone um, uh, raised a question uh, about being a Latina and, and just the lack of diversity within the field of law overall um, and, and the lack of accessibility for people of color. And, you know, I, I have to be a little frank here. I think sometimes there are assumptions made about the area of civil rights that by nature will be diverse. Uh, I can tell you that's not always the case. Um, unfortunately, even organizations uh, that, that have that moniker civil rights can reproduce some of the inequalities, uh, reproduce racism, frankly. Uh, and, and again, I think part of that is, is some of the things we discussed earlier, in, in, including who has access to these opportunities, whether it's a, 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 you being able to do, whether it's a free internship or a low, in pay, low paid internship, uh, being able to, to take a pay cut. Uh, and so I think it's also important that we speak to that and we speak to uh, ways that you have found to personally address even within the civil rights community, uh, whether it's racism in the workplace or other challenges, how have you uh, addressed those in being mindful as, as well of, of taking care of yourself? And I, I'm gonna put Andrew on the spot here uh, <laughs> with that question. <laughs> Well, I have so many thoughts and reflections to that. The first that comes to mind is a reminder from a dear friend of mine, Amber J. Phillips, 
that the personal is political and vice versa, right? And so especially in this moment of the pandemic where everything has shifted, I think there's been this emphasis on letting my personal experience inform my political praxis. And then I think about the NAP ministry, which is a social media account that I cannot recommend enough. Janelle knows how active I am on social media. But basically it's a framework of rest as reparations, right? And recognizing that, especially for black folks in the United States and other folks at the margins, but especially black folks in the context of the NAP ministry, that has to be a part of the framework, that rest has to be embedded into how we do this work and how we achieve the revolution, right? And so I have especially thoughtful about giving abundant grace and compassion to myself and those in my network during this time and making sure that that's how I'm doing the work, right? That I'm extending grace and compassion and resting when I need to during this incredibly surreal time. And when it's the time to challenge these institutions, whether they be nonprofits or they be entities that are purporting to do the work but not really living up to the ideals, then I can use the rest I've really prioritized in my life to inform my ability to call folks and say, this is, <laughs> and you know, we need to be thinking about as a civil rights organization, how we are practicing what we preach day in and day. Thank you, Patrice. Well, which part of your question would be most helpful to answer? The sort of self-care part or the transition part or the <laughs> racism <laughs> and sexism in the workplace part? Which, which, whichever part you would like to, to address. <laughs> um, so I guess, I'll try to focus on the question that was asked about um, being a Latina in the in the community. How do you how do you feel about sort of working in a profession that has been has excluded people of color for a long time? I think seeing the dramatic increase in the number of Black lawyers every five years, ten years, has made me. Um, frustrated at the fact that there hasn't been more progress. I think I'm sort of like very aware of the fact that for a long time there weren't very many black lawyers at all. And now we have even more people incarcerated and even more um, racial disparities in our criminal justice system than we did before. And it's, uh, it's disappointing to me that we're not organizing ourselves as attorneys to make sure that we're addressing um, the needs of our community. And I think organizations like the National Bar Association, the American Bar Association have a, have a role to play in that, um, that we should really be engaging, not just attorneys of color, of course, all attorneys, but it's, it's especially um, shocking to me that we're not doing more as, um, as associations and organizations to make sure that we're supporting lawyers of color and the greater community. So. I hope to see us getting better at that as time goes on as well. And I think this moment of reckoning that we're having in 2020 is a good opportunity for a turning point like that as well. Great, thank you. Leticia, could you, did you- Yeah, I'll just say something quick. I'll try to answer, um, I, I mean, I'll answer two of the questions. I think it's important to take care of yourself. If you, if you don't, it can be difficult to take care of others. And uh, we all know these are challenging issues and, um, topics and civil rights, broadly speaking, social justice is, um, is, is, is challenging to advance in many ways, unfortunately. So take care of yourself and you can, it will better position you to be able to advance the work. Um, and then to the piece around um, what you do or how you, how you address these isms that come up and whether they're in the you know, civil rights community or not or elsewhere, for me, you address them the same way. I mean, the country is built on systemic isms, racism and everything else under the sun. So that, that does not, that means that um, regardless of how someone looks or what their identities are, that they too are, um, may possibly be doing harm um, and to, to those who look just like them. I mean, we know that. So, um, or you should know that if you don't know that. Uh, so you have, to, you have to think about it and deal with it in the same way. You know, you call a spade a spade. Um, and there, there are ways that you can do that. I know that, that people are navigating all sorts of different 
situations um, in terms of work environments, but it is what it is. I mean, and, and it's, you know, when, when someone is a person of color who, who harms another or a, a law enforcement officer of color who might shoot another person of color, that doesn't, that doesn't make it okay. You know, it's, that, that has happened within the context of a larger systemic racism that, that is the root um, of many things in this country. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, Marcy, did you want to speak to that before we go to audience Q&A? Um, I'll, I'll just say one quick point on the self-care component of all of that. And that's, you know, law schools need to do more in this space. And we need to do more to actually support self-care rather than just tell students to engage in self-care. So one of the things that I do in my clinic is I actually have a seminar on it where we do a mindfulness exercise. We um, do um, four or five different, you know, um, components and, and um, uh skill or things to tr show students that not everything is going to work for them, but something will work for them. And I, I do it intentionally to show my students that I think this is a lawyering skill. Self-care is a lawyering competency. And not only is it a lawyering competency, I let my students build some time to self-care so that I'm not just saying this is added on to everything else. And unless, you know, um, the, the, associations and the structures that are are turning out lawyers right recognize that self-care is a component that is um, relevant and not just relevant but needed for for effective long-term arc lawyering as opposed to temporary one moment lawyering um, uh, students and new lawyers aren't going to recognize that this is as important as understanding the doctrine of employment law that I teach you in that class and so I hope that other um, institutional supports for these types of issues um, continue to happen so. Thank you, Marcy. I, I think that's so powerful to think of self-care as a competency, as a key competency. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's that's so important, and, and I think you're absolutely right that that's not um, instilled, whether it's by instant law schools or or a, a lot of workplaces, frankly, and even again, civil rights organizations. And I, you know, I'll be honest, I've been part of some where where they talk about self care, but it is not. Uh, practiced <laughs> and it's it it really is self preservation and uh, being proactive for your own care uh, is so important. I want to uh, transition to audience questions and please, if you can infuse more of the self care pieces throughout, I think that's really important. Uh, but Kiana Butler asked, as an activist in Baltimore and now a first year evening law student, I'm really interested in going into a practice that stays true to my activist roots. Do you have any advice about uh, finding career options for someone in my position? And also, how did you manage to stay true to your roots without losing yourself uh, in the law career options? And I think that's such a powerful question. Uh, you know, like most law school, my law school uh, really emphasized private practice. Uh, and I knew going in, I, I worked for a few years in between undergrad and law school. So I, I knew going in, that was not my agenda. Uh, and, and it was hard at times to not feel that pressure, to not feel that influence, but I, I had to keep refocusing myself on why I was there, what was my purpose, and to gain those tools so that I could go back. That was always my intent, uh, to go back and affect change uh, in, in the public interest realm. I didn't know exactly what that would look like. I, you know, I've held jobs that I didn't even know existed. I didn't know you could go and be legislative counsel to a U.S. Senator or a member of Congress. I didn't even know that was available, but I kept myself open to possibilities. And when I learned about possibilities where I could insert myself, I, I kind of jumped on those. So uh, let's, let's see, I'll put Andrew on the spot again with that. Um, how do you stay true to your roots without losing yourself in, in the career options? Yeah, I think it's a constant balance and tension that we strive to achieve, right? I loved Marcy's reflection on living in the Southwest and not expecting to live in Arizona for you know, five years or so. And for me, I feel as much of a Midwesterner as I am a Southerner and, and really let that heritage inform my work. 
So I think one is staying really close to the folks who had informed me along my journey. You know, it's my parents, sister and niece in quarantine. Yeah, you know, where I've been in Oklahoma for the majority of the year. But it is also sticking to those organizations on the ground. And this might require a bit of research and might require a bit of nimbleness in the time of the coronavirus pandemic where you can't meet in person. Recognizing those folks who are really getting down on the ground floor, right? Directly in people, folks impacted by the criminal legal system, by the school to prison pipeline, who are leading the charge in their communities to change these policies, right? Kind of recognizing the closest to the problem or closest to the solution. So if you do choose to go to law school, I would say maybe consider being a volunteer organization. You know, an example that comes to mind is the Dream Defenders in Florida uh, and, you know, provide support, whatever you can do, uh, either as a law student or as just a community volunteer. Uh, and then perhaps consider when you graduate from law school, if time and capacity, you know, offering your pro bono services to those organizations and being of support to them and service to them in any way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You also serve on the board uh, of an organization as well, um, Andrew. So that's another. I agree, I do, yeah. That Learn Together, Live Together, the DC School Integration Nonprofit. Yeah, I agree. Board membership is a really great way as a law student or young lawyer to really engage in, in some good community work. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to uh, speak to that question? Um, I'll chime in. So I think it's important to acknowledge that it's been like a privilege to stay in this space, right? I had a safety net in case working for myself at my own law office fell through. Like I knew that there were people in the back of my mind. I knew there were people who would make sure that I didn't go hungry or unhoused and not everybody has that luxury. Some people have children to take care of and other financial obligations that um, make it much harder to make those decisions. I think a lot of law schools push big law on students because they want students to be able to give back, right? Their businesses and they want the students to leave and make money and, and contribute to their endowments. Um, and I think what law schools should consider doing, because there are so many students who have a strong interest in, in doing something that's more community rooted, is teach students how to be enterprising, right? Teach them how they could start their own low bono firm and make enough money um, to do well. Teach them how to tap into philanthropy and get money to do what they want to do for the world. I mean, it took me a really long time to realize that people would give me money to do good work um, just based on your expertise and your passion uh, for the work that you want to do. So if we were to teach law students that earlier on, I think the schools would benefit and I think the students would benefit as well. Um, but for those of you who are already kind of in the place of having to make that decision, there's nothing wrong with taking a, a well-paid job in another field and, and giving back as a volunteer on the side or waiting until the moment in your career that you feel comfortable doing that. Large law firms are interested in teaching you how to be great writers, which is fundamentally what young lawyers need to learn to do well. And so however you get that skill set, you can always apply it to doing really great community work later. Thank you, Patrice. And it, it looks like we're getting a lot of questions about organizations. What any suggestions about organizations, either where uh, people can volunteer. Someone uh, mentioned that they are uh, retiring from government work and, and want to embark on a, a second career in civil rights work. Uh, another person mentioned uh, that they're doing work as a paralegal and uh, they're an activist and, and freelance reporter and want to, to be involved in doing the work. Uh, so any suggestions? And also I, I'm gonna piggyback on that question. Someone asked, does location matter? Um, uh, and and they, they mentioned specifically for criminal justice work, should you be near uh, a, a, a prison?
prison facility or government headquarters, does location matter? Um, and I will jump in briefly <laughs> for that one and just say, you know, DC is such a great location if you want to do public policy. Uh, but there are other, you st there are state capitals that, that you can work at uh, or near as well to, to affect policy. Local policy is very, very important and often overlooked. Um, and as someone who's worked at the, the federal level of, of policymaking, I would also emphasize a lot of federal policies replicate local and state policies. They're, they're built upon a lot of these policies uh, from the local level. So I, one thought I have is, is to start where you are. Uh, whether it's a, a you know your local council or commission to engage, um, and, and you still can make a uh, uh, I wouldn't even say still you can make a tremendous impact um, from different levels. So um, let's see who can who can speak <laughs> speak more to that. Any thoughts about organizations? Um, and again, uh, if, if folks have thoughts about location as well. We always think of the traditional ACLU or other organizations, but other thoughts, Leticia? I'll just say quickly, I, I mean, I, I agree 100%. I said there, there are needs everywhere, um, all over this country and beyond. And so wherever you are, there, there are opportunities. Um, you, you can expose yourself, hopefully, if you have time, to a wider variety for those who might be in law school so that you can see what it's like to work at the local, state, perhaps federal levels, different works, I mean, doing this work and every organization carries that out in a different way. But there is a, there is a wide variety just everywhere um, because these issues are prevalent and present everywhere. Um, so I would just encourage you, you don't, you don't have to pick up and move somewhere to do it unless, unless your personal circumstances require it that. But wherever you are, you can definitely start um, doing the work. That, that's what I would say. And, you, you may be surprised, but there are more people engaged in it than you might think. Um, there are lots of local organizations. I mean, I'm not going to throw out names because there's so many. And, and as I think about some of the work um, that we've done to advance policies at the national level, most of the people behind that are people working on the local levels, like in states around the country. So like, and, and we're just doing it in coalition in that way. So um, you just have to do a little bit of research, um, get on Google and, and do some other things and connect with folks and they can, they can perhaps help, help you out. And then to the paralegal um, questions around um, being a paralegal and getting, getting involved in this work, there are many, um, you know, I know, and I know, I know Janelle knows others. There are several times when paralegals at um, civil rights organizations or even at firms engaging in this work become attorneys at, um, doing that same work, sometimes at the same organization. Um, so that, those, those, there are many opportunities to be involved and engaged um, at all levels. And you know, your title doesn't have to be attorney um, to do that. Great, great, thank you. So it looks like we have about three minutes left. Um, so <laughs> I will ask everyone just to do a quick um, round of um, what gives you hope in this moment of, of doing this work uh, as we think about how exhausting it can be, how um, uh, personally uh, draining it can feel and discouraging it can feel at, at this time. Uh, just your, your thoughts on, on what makes you hopeful. Um, and we'll start with uh, Marcy. Uh, the things that make me hopeful right now are that you can see change happening. You can see it happening um, in city councils. You can see it happening um, nationally about just who is sharing their voice and whose voices are getting amplified in different ways. And that gives me hope and I'll, I'll close by saying not to be a broken record, but my students give me hope every day. You know, I, I'm teaching evening clinic this semester and I'm meeting with my students at 1030 at night and at 7 a.m. because they have full time jobs and caregiving responsibilities and their willingness to better themselves and meet with me at those moments um, inspires me for what civil rights are going to look like 10 years from now. Thank you, Patrice. I had the same answer as Marcy, actually. My students have been the biggest um, influence lately. I had every intention of starting DC Justice Lab in 2021. 
And shortly after George Floyd died, my students were reaching out, okay, Professor Zoltan, what do we do about this? And um, their energy around this and commitment to it has been really um, exceptional. And it's, I didn't see that same energy when I was in law school at all. I think I'm the only person I know in my class who went on to be a public defender. And I have had um, many students who went into that space since I've been teaching. So I'm just really excited to see like new lawyers um, really being interested in the work. Thank you. Uh, Andrew. My nearly nine month old niece, you know, I'm so thankful that she was born at the beginning of February because what a year. <laughs> but yeah, just seeing her grow and like, but coming to herself even, you know, as she approaches a year old. And again, that personal being political and prioritizing family feels like the perfect place for me to be in this year, 2020. Give me Thank so much hope. Thank you, Andrew. And Leticia, what gives you hope? I, I think it just, I'm just gonna echo what everyone else said. It's really the continued interest that people have, the passion that people continue to have to advance um, justice, issues of justice. And uh, that that is, that's what gives me hope that there will be change and continue to be change. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks so much for everyone who joined us. Thank you for your input, profound apologies for the questions that, that we could not get to. We will, we will work to, to follow up with folks. And I see that a lot of the panelists shared their uh, email addresses. Uh, so please, uh, please follow up with us, be in touch with us. And again, being mindful that this is the first of uh, four uh, discussions that we will have in this series. Uh, so please join us for the subsequent uh, discussions and we will post uh, the uh, registration and information for those sec sections. Uh, I, and I just want to, uh, again, thank our panelists for their time and for their input. Uh, and also to thank the ABA uh, for more than five decades, the section and its members have worked on hundreds of issues addressing a broad range of civil rights, civil liberties, and international human rights. And today, the section continues to promote policies affecting religious freedom, LGBTQ rights, gender equity, and other significant civil rights issues. So please consider making a donation to the section to continue this great work and this great programming. Um, and I'll put this in the, the chat. It's donate dot americanbar.org backslash crsj for civil rights and social justice uh, section uh, and your gift will help to continue to advance this work thank you so much to ali kilsgaard uh, who has put this <laughs> put the link in the chat and to paula shapiro for all of their work and support uh, to our chair angela scott uh, for her work and her vision uh, for this series. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us uh, this afternoon, this late morning in some places. Thank you so much.